Hello everyone and welcome back to our course on snarks. In this lecture we're going to look at a fascinating idea called a recursive snark. First we will look at what recursion is good for and then we will see how to construct efficient recursive snarks. To begin with I want to quickly review the three algorithms that, that make up a snark. So as you remember a pre-processing snark is a triple of algorithms S, P, and V. The setup algorithm will take a circuit and pre-process it to output public parameters for the prover and public parameters for the verifier. The proving algorithm will use the parameters for the prover, the statement x, and the witness w to produce a proof pi. The verifier will use the verifier parameters, the statement x, and the proof pi to decide whether to accept or to reject the proof. Now, in the last couple of lectures, we saw several snark constructions. For example, we looked at GRAS16 and the Planck snark, in particular Planck using the KZG polynomial commitment scheme. We said that these constructions actually lead to short proofs, but the prover time is not linear. It actually runs in time n log n, where n is the size of the computation. We refer to this as a quasi-linear time prover. We also looked at other SNARK constructions, in particular FRI-based constructions, as well as coding-based constructions like Breakdown, Orion, Orion Plus. These systems, we said, have in practice a faster prover, but unfortunately they generate longer proofs. So one question you could ask is, you know, can we have the best of both worlds where we have a fast prover, but one that also produces very short proofs? So to begin to answer that question, let's first look at the general principle of SNARK recursion. So what do we mean when we talk about proof recursion? Well, let's start with a two-level snark recursion and explain what that means. So normally when we apply a snark, of course, you know, we have a statement X and a witness W and we produce a proof that the witness W is a valid witness for the statement X. In a recursive snark, the idea is not to produce the actual proof, but rather to produce a proof of knowledge of a proof. Yeah, this idea sometimes can blow your mind in that we're not proving that we know a witness for the statement X, but rather we prove that we know a proof of a witness for the statement X. Yeah, and so let's see how that works. So let's suppose that we start with a statement X and a witness W, and we're gonna use our proof system, our snark, to actually, as usual, produce a proof that the witness W is a valid witness for the statement X. Yeah, so here, this proof pi here proves knowledge of W such that C of XW is equal to zero. But that's not where we're gonna stop. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna run another proof system on top of this proof. Now the public statement is still going to be the statement X, but the witness for the second proof system is actually going to be the proof pi that came out of the first system. So what the second system is actually doing is proving knowledge of a proof that the witness W is a valid witness for the statement X. So we're not directly proving knowledge of the witness, we're proving knowledge of a proof that the witness is valid. Okay, so we end up with a proof pi prime, and what it actually proves is that this second prover, p prime, knows pi such that pi is a valid proof for the statement x. So the circuit that the prover p prime is working with is actually the verification circuit v for the first system SPV. So the first system, what we'll often call the inner system, is actually proving knowledge of a witness W relative to the circuit C. The outer system, the second system, S prime, P prime, V prime, is actually producing a proof relative to a circuit that implements the verification algorithm V of the inner system. So you can see that pi prime is a recursive proof because we're proving knowledge of a proof rather than directly proving knowledge of a witness. So this picture is actually quite important in this lecture, where the whole point of recursion is that instead of directly proving knowledge of a witness, we're proving knowledge of a proof that a witness exists. So let's look at the first application for this. And the first application is to build a system that has a fast prover and the resulting proof is also short. So let's assume that the inner proof system, this SPV proof system, is one that actually has a fast prover, but maybe it results in a large proof. So let's say the prover and the verifier are fast in this system, but the final proof pi here is ra rather long, say 100 kilobytes to be concrete. What we'd like to do is now we'd like to compress this proof to something much shorter. And what we can do is we can run the outer system which now maybe is a slower prover, but results in a, in a shorter proof. And now the outer proof system will again prove that the verifier of the inner system would accept the witness proof pi, and that will result in an outer proof pi prime, which is say now only a, a kilobyte long. Now, the point of this is imagine that the circuit C that we're actually proving 
knowledge of a witness for, imagine this circuit C is gigantic. So constructing a proof for the circuit C directly using the outer system would actually be quite slow because of the slow prover. It would result in a small proof, in a short proof, but it would take quite a while to generate that proof. Well, what we instead will do is we'll use this inner proof system to quickly produce a proof for the large circuit C for which we're trying to prove the W is a valid witness. That will run faster than the outer proof system, but it will generate a large proof. And what we'll do is we'll run the outer system just on the verifier on the inner system. And so if the verifier circuit for the inner system is smaller than the circuit that we're trying to prove using the inner system, the outer system will then work much faster than if we had tried to use the outer system to generate a proof for the original circuit C, right? Because now the outer system is only being applied to the verification circuit of the inner system. So in this way, we get the best of both worlds. Basically, we use the fast proof to process the large circuit that actually looks at W directly. But of course, that produces a large proof. And then we use the inner system, which has a slower prover, but now is being applied to a much smaller circuit, namely just the verifier of the inner system. And now the final result will only be a kilobyte long proof. Yeah, and so the nice thing here is we get a fast overall prover and the final proof is actually short, so we kind of get the best of both worlds. And as I say, this only is applicable when the verifier circuit for the inner system is much simpler than the actual statement we're trying to prove. So this is something that's very useful for proving very complex statements. And this actually comes up quite a bit when doing proofs for things called a ZK EVM, when we're trying to prove a large execution of the EVM. Of course, when the verifier wants to verify that W in fact exists, so the prover actually knows that W such as C of X W is equal to zero, it will verify the recursive proof pi prime and the proof pi will never be seen by the actual real world verifier. So you might be wondering why is this sound at all, right? So why is this an okay thing to do? And so let's walk through a quick argument as to why this, this recursive construction provide knowledge soundness. Yeah, so let's fix some circuit C. Yeah, the circuit you can see takes n field elements that represent the statement, m field elements to represent the witness, and it outputs zero or one, basically saying whether the witness is valid for the statement or not. Now let's quickly review the definition of knowledge soundness, which is what we're trying to prove here. And so as usual, we said that a snark SPV is knowledge sound for a circuit C, if the following holds. It so happens that for every malicious polynomial time prover A, there is an efficient extractor E that satisfies the, the following property. So for all statements that we could imagine, we'll call the statement Y, if we look at the probability that our malicious prover is able to produce a valid proof, right? This probability here captures the probability that our malicious prover is able to produce a convincing proof for the statement Y. What we'd like is no matter what this probability is, the extractor, when it runs on the statement Y, it's able to actually extract a witness for this malicious prover, and the probability that it produces a valid witness is greater than the probability that the malicious prover is able to convince the verifier, minus some small epsilon, some negligible epsilon. This epsilon is called the knowledge error. So if for every efficient prover, there's, a, there's an efficient extractor that satisfies this inequality, then we say that the system is knowledge sound. Okay, so we'd like to prove that our two-level recursive snark is knowledge sound for a particular circuit C. So let's C prime be the circuit that actually is used by the outer system. Yeah, so the C prime is a circuit that basically runs the verifier of the inner system using the proof pi as a witness. In addition, let's say that we have a convincing prover. So A is a convincing prover for the outer system, S prime, P prime, V prime, with respect to this circuit C prime. What we need to do is we need to build an extractor that doesn't extract the proof pi. That's not what we want. What we want is an extractor that actually extracts a witness for the original circuit C. Okay, so let's see how to build this extractor. So here we wrote down again the conditions, right? So we have the outer proof system is being applied to the circuit C prime, and we have a malicious prover A that's able to produce a convincing proof with respect to this circuit C prime. So here's how our extractor is going to work. So we're given some statement X, and of course we're given the verification parameters for the inner system. What our extractor will do is the following. Well, we know that the outer system is knowledge sound for the circuit C prime. Yeah, that's by assumption. That means that there's an extractor E prime 
that can extract from the prover A, it can extract a proof pi such that the circuit C prime is satisfied. In other words, the inner verification algorithm given the extracted proof pi will output yes. Okay, but now look at this E prime. E prime is a, is a circuit that outputs a proof pi that convinces the inner proof system. In other words, E prime now is a convincing prover for the inner proof system. Well, be, then because the inner proof system by itself is null and sound, we know that there is a, exists an extractor E that can extract from the extractor E prime, treating this E prime as a malicious prover, this extractor E can extract a witness from E prime such that C of X W is equal to zero. Yeah, so we kind of extract in two steps. We extract a proof from the outer proof system. And now that we have an extractor for a proof from the outer proof system, we can run the extractor of the inner proof system and obtain the actual witness for the statement that we're interested in. Yeah, so it's a two-step extraction process. And let's see how likely is this extraction to succeed. So I claim that our extractor, which is made up of running two extractors, one after the other, I claim that that's going to succeed with exactly the probability that A convinces the outer proof system minus the sum of the two knowledge errors. So why is that? Well, let's see. So the adversary A, the malicious prover, when we apply the extractor for the outer system, we know that we'll be able to succeed in producing a proof for the inner system with exact same probability minus the negligible knowledge error for the outer proof system. And now when we run the extractor of the inner proof system, we'll know that we'll be able to extract a valid witness with the same probability minus the knowledge error of the inner proof system. So overall, we succeed in extracting a witness for the circuit C with knowledge error epsilon prime plus epsilon, which is still negligible because both epsilon prime and epsilon are negligible and the sum of negligible values is negligible. Okay, so this is why the two-level recursive construction is sound because we can extract from the outer proof system, then extract again from the inner proof system, and that results in the actual witness that we're interested in. One thing that we have to be a little careful with is that in fact, the, the running time of these extractors might get worse and worse as we kind of run through the recursion. In particular, imagine that the running time of the extractor E prime for the outer proof system, let's say it's twice the running time of the malicious prover. And the same would hold for the inner proof system. Imagine the extractor for the inner proof system runs at twice the time of the malicious prover for the inner proof system. Now the time for our overall extractor was four times the time of the malicious prover that we were given. So for a two level recursion, this is perfectly fine, right? Four times the time is still polynomial time, so we're all happy. But imagine in an n level recursive system, if we have to repeat this process n times, yeah, so we extract from the outermost system, then the second outermost, third outermost, and so on and so forth, we kind of repeat this n times, the final extractor that we end up with will run now in time two to the n times the original malicious prover, and that's no longer polynomial time. So we end up with an extractor that's not valid because it doesn't run in polynomial time. So this is something that we have to be careful with when we do recursion in that the recursion depth in effect can only be logarithmic in the security parameter. Otherwise we end up with an extractor that runs for too long. One might view this as just as an artifact of our proof technique. The fact that we compose these extractors one inside of the other, maybe there's another proof technique that avoids this kind of exponential blow up. But in general, we're gonna try and limit our recursion depth to be at most logarithmic in the security parameter. And that actually avoids this problem. But in some applications, we'll ignore this technical issue and give a construction that actually uses linear recursive depth and I'll tell you that usually, whenever we have a construction with a linear recursive depth, we usually can convert it into a construction of logarithmic recursive depth. There's another issue with recursion that I wanted to bring out, and that is that when we construct SNARK systems, we very often use the fiat chimere transformation to transform an interactive proof system into a non-interactive one. If you remember, the fiat chimere transformation introduces the notion of a random oracle, where the, the prover and verifier generate the challenges by using a hash function, which we model as a random oracle, in order to make the proof system non-interactive. The question is when we do recursion, now all of a sudden we end up with a verifier that has random oracle gates embedded in the verification circuit. But now, you know, the recursive prover has to work with the verification circuit of the inner proof system. But if this ver verification circuit has random oracle gates in it, the recursive prover doesn't know what to do with those gates. Yeah, those are not kind of computational gates, they call out to a random oracle. 
which the prover cannot handle. So somehow we have to get rid of these random oracle gates before recursion can actually be made to work. And so there's a standard answer to this. And the answer is what we do is before we start the recursive process, we instantiate all the random oracles in the verifier's circuit with a concrete hash function. Yeah, so we replace the random oracle, say we shot to 56 or some other hash function that maybe is more amenable to arithmetic circuits like Poseidon. But the point is we replace the random oracle with a very concrete hash function. Of course, once we move away from the random oracle model, now we no longer have a security proof that the snark system is null and sound. So we have to just assume that after this substitution, the proof system is still null and sound. We can justify that assumption by the fact that it is true in the random oracle model, but strictly speaking, once we instantiate the random oracle, now we have to make another assumption that the instantiated system is still secure. The point is now that we have an instantiated system where now the verifier circuit no longer uses random oracle gates, now it uses a concrete hash function. So the verification circuit is a concrete circuit. This now allows us to recurse because now the outer prover can actually process the verification circuit of the inner snark system. But of course, to prove now that the resulting recursive snark is secure, we have to rely on this somewhat ugly assumption, which is to say that this concrete system with the random oracle replaced by a real hash function is still knowledge sound. Okay, so to summarize our discussion so far, the first application we saw for recursion had to do with proof compression. And I should stress, of course, that that construction would generalize to three levels of recursions and four levels of recursion and so on and so forth. There was nothing magical about stopping at just two levels of recursion. The next application I want to show you is for the purpose of streaming proof generation. Yeah, so what does that mean? What does it mean to stream proof generation? Well, imagine we have a prover, like for example, in the case of a rollup, that actually needs to prove many statements at once. Yeah, it needs to prove that a whole bunch of transactions, like a thousand transactions, are all valid. What that means is it's actually trying to pr prove that it knows W1, W2 up to Wn, such that W1 is valid witness for x1, w2 is a valid witness for x2, and so on and so forth. So it's trying to prove this conjunction of statements. The problem with this is if you have to pr produce one monolithic proof for this entire conjunction, that actually can be quite expensive and slow to build. In particular, you can only start to construct this proof after you have all the end statements that you're trying to prove. But in reality, that's not what happens, right? In reality, when you build a roll-up system, the public will send you transactions one at a time. Now you can wait until you have a thousand transactions and then start to, to produce the proof of all thousand transactions at once. But what we'd like to do is we'd like to start to generate the proof that the transactions are valid as soon as the first transaction is already available. Yeah, so we call this streaming proof generation because we don't want to wait until all the statements are available before we can generate the proof. We'd like to start to generate the proof as the statements are being sent to us. And again, recursion is a very good way to do this. And let's kind of look at two worlds to explain the problem. So imagine we have like 100 transactions that are being sent to us. Naively, as we said, we can only start to generate the proof for these 100 transactions only after the last transaction was submitted. Right? And so here, there's going to be quite a long delay before the last transaction is submitted and the time that we can actually submit the proof to the layer one chain. We'd like to do something better. And the way we'll do this better is exactly using recursion. Yeah, so we'll take the first set of 10 transactions and then we'll generate a proof for them. Then we'll generate a proof for the second batch of 10 transactions and so on and so on and so forth. So you see, we're already generating proofs while the transactions are still streaming in. And then finally, once all the transactions are available, all we have to do is we have to take the 10 proofs that we generated and generate a proof of proofs, right? So we have to generate a proof that says that these 10 proofs are valid. And then finally, this becomes the proof that we post to the layer one chain. And the point is that now the only thing we have to do after all 100 transactions are received is produce a proof for the batch of last 10 transactions along with a proof of proofs. And both of these operations are much, much faster than generating a monolithic proof for all the transactions once they're all received. Yeah, so we end up with a much shorter delay between the time that the last transaction is received and we can post things to the layer one. Okay, so again, this is another very cute application of recursion I want you to think about as a way to kind of speed up proof generation when the statements are streaming at you one at a time. Okay, so we have two more applications that I wanna show you and then we'll start to look at how to construct efficient recursive proofs. 
So the next application is actually kind of, kind of an important application. It's what's called incrementally verifiable computation or IVC. This is something that can also be used to speed up proof generation quite a bit. So the setup here is that we have a very long computation that's done by iterating some fixed function f. Yeah, so you can see here that the computation starts at some initial state as zero. A first input comes in, we'll call it omega one. We apply the function f, we get a new state as one. Another input comes in, we get a new state as two. We keep doing this until finally we end up with the final state as n. Yeah, and our goal is basically to produce a succinct proof that the prover knows witnesses omega one to omega n such that the final output Sn is in fact correct. In other words, Sn is the result of applying omega one to omega n to the initial state S zero. Here the verifier is gonna know the function f of course, because that's a public function. It knows how many steps we ran the function for. It has the initial state and it has the final state and it just wants to verify that the final state is correct. So this is actually something that happens quite often in practice. It's a very real world problem, especially if you think of F as like a microprocessor. So imagine F literally implements a simple microprocessor. And then what happens here is we're literally stepping through the state of a computation. And since F is a Turing complete microprocessor, this basically captures an arbitrary computation that just happens by running this microprocessor for many, many, many cycles. Now, since we mentioned long computations that are done by iterating a function f, I can't resist the connection to deep thought, right? Deep thought, as you may remember from uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is a computer that was built by the civilization. The civilization asked the computer, you know, what's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? And the computer said, oh, that's a very interesting problem. It's going to take me 7 million years to figure out the answer. And so it worked for 7 million years. This is this long computation that we are thinking of here. And at the end of the 7 million years, it said the answer is 42. So it wasn't a very helpful answer, but that was the answer. And so that's an example of a very long computation for which one might also want to generate a succinct proof that the computation was done correctly. And therefore 42 really is the correct answer to life, the universe, and everything. So we wouldn't have to take deep thoughts word for it. Okay, so let's first of all look at the construction and then I'll show you some examples where IVC actually comes up. So the construction is a very natural idea. Maybe m many of you already see it. What we're gonna do is basically at every step, we're of course gonna output the state at that step, but we're also going to output a proof that the computation is correct up until that step, yeah? And so specifically, right, so for i equals one to n, in step i, the prover is gonna output the current state si, along with a proof pi i, and what does this proof prove? This proof pi i proves that the prover has a witness, namely si minus one, the previous state, omega i, namely the input to the current step, and the proof that the previous state was correct. And the witness basically has to satisfy the following properties. First of all, it has to be the case that, you know, if we apply f to this, previous state with omega i, we get the current state. Okay, so this proves that si is correct. And more importantly, we prove that the proof pi i minus one of the previous state is in fact a valid proof relative to the previous state of the computation. So again, at every step, we output the current state in a proof. And what the proof proves is that a, the current state is correct relative to the previous state, and that the proof of the previous state is also correct relative to the previous state. So I'd like to very briefly convince you that this means that the last proof pi n along with the final output Sn proves that in fact the prover knows w1 to wn such that the output Sn is in fact correct. So why is that true? Well, what we need to do is build an extractor to prove knowledge soundness, right? We want to prove that the prover knows omega1 to omega n that make Sn correct. Well, so how do we do that? Well, we're gonna run the extractor on pi n, right? And one, what is the extractor gonna extract from pi n? Well, it's gonna extract a valid witness for the previous state. Well, this valid witness at the point n minus one proves to us that f of s n minus one is equal to s n, and that pi of n minus one is a valid proof for the previous statement. Well, now we're gonna run the extractor again, and each time we run it, we're gonna extract the previous state until the very beginning, where we will extract s zero, and then the verified circuit just checks that S0 is in fact the correct initial state. Okay, so because we can run the extractor iteratively and extract literally all the states in the computation, and we know that all these states actually are correct, we can deduce from this that pi of n proves that Sn really is the correct output of the computation. 
So this was a little bit of a high level description of how the extractor works, but this actually can be made into a formal argument. And it might be a good exercise for you to convince yourself that by repeatedly applying the extractor, we actually can recover the entire computation trace and that computation trace must be correct. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering about what I said earlier about linear recursion depth versus logarithmic recursion depth. I'm not going to get into the details here, but just know that in fact, this IVC can also be proven secure using only logarithmic depth recursions. So what I did here is I kind of wrote out more explicitly what is the statement that's being proved at each step. And you can see the, the, the statement is actually that S sub i is the correct state at step i, and the proof by i is the proof that actually proves that. And what I wrote here in red are the, actually the witness values that are used to prove that this statement is correct. So what really, what the proof pi i is proving to us is it proves that I know a witness, you know, containing s sub i minus one, omega i, and pi i minus one for the statement that we just wrote here, such that in fact, you know, if I apply f to the witness element s sub i minus one, omega i, I get the statement element s i. And if I apply the verification algorithm to the witness element that contains the proof in the previous state, the answer actually will be yes. Now, I actually even wrote down the verifier here. This verifier actually just verifies this, this circuit, which is a relatively simple circuit. This is a constant size circuit independent of the depth of the computation. And the verifier just verifies this one proof pi n to say that this is a valid proof and therefore this is a valid statement and therefore Sn is computed correctly. Okay, so that's how IVC works. So these ideas are very elegant, but they definitely take some thinking to see why this all works and why it's all correct. So let's talk about some applications of IVC. So the first application is the one we already talked about, where you can take a long computation and break it into a sequence of small steps, like if the function f implements a microprocessor, like steps of a RISC-V or steps of the EVM. All the prover has to do now is prove one step of the computation at a time, as opposed to proving a monolithic proof over the entire lifetime of the computation, right? We're just doing one step of this function f rather than proving everything all at once. And because we're proving only a single step, this is a simple enough proof that it greatly reduces the memory re requirements of the prover. Now the memory requirements are only the ones needed to prove a single step of the computation. This is kind of the reason why people like to do recursion in that it allows us to prove very, very, very large statements that we might not otherwise be able to because of memory requirements, for example, but we can do it like one step at a time and that actually does not require that much memory at all. There are two more applications of IVC that, that I wanted to mention, which are very cute. The first one is basically a way to build a single short succinct proof that the current state of the blockchain is correct. So I can compress the validity proof of an entire blockchain into a single succinct proof. And the way we do that is basically we make S0 be the initial state of the chain. We make Sn be the current state of the chain, yeah? And then the omega one to omega n, the inputs that we provided to F at every step, are basically blocks of valid transactions. And literally the transition from S0 to S1 is just a transition that says omega one is a block of valid transactions. And here is how these transactions change the state of the chain. So the proof that Sn is correct is a short proof that's fast to verify to say that all the blocks are valid and they in fact lead to the current state Sn. And that's already convincing the verifier that Sn is correct. Yeah, without this type of mechanism, if a new verifier wakes up and it wants to verify that Sn is correct, it would have to download all the blocks and rerun them all by itself until it obtains Sn, and only then is it convinced that the blockchain is correct. With these IVC methods, when a, ver a new verifier wakes up and wants to verify the current state of the chain, all it has to do is verify the proof pi. Of course, it has to make sure that everybody agrees on the same Sn. That's a consensus problem but validating this Sn is correct is done by a very short and succinct proof. So this is used by the MENA blockchain where you can verify the entire state of the chain by literally verifying just one proof. Another application I wanted to mention is what's called a verifiable delay function, where the goal here is to compute a function in such a way that the computation cannot be sped up by parallelism. So we want a sequential computation but do it in such a way that once you compute the final answer, it's actually quite easy to convince somebody else that Sn is correct. So the way we do that is basically using a hash chain. Yeah, so we start from some state S0, we apply the hash over and over again, we end up with Sn. Yeah, so this is often denoted as h to the power of n of S0. 
And the IVC proof will now prove that SN is correct using a short proof that's fast to verify. And the reason we use IVC is again, so the prover can actually do this proof one step at a time without having to resort to a huge amount of memory that's needed to do the monolithic proof if it wanted to do it all at once. So IVC allows us to do these proofs of long computations with relatively little memory. Okay, and the last application I'll give you, and then we'll stop with applications and start with constructions, is this coming market for ZK provers. Yeah, so you know people have GPUs in their homes, maybe for gaming rigs and such. They don't use these GPUs all the time. They might wanna rent out the GPUs so other people can use them. And then there's gonna be a market for these provers where the market is, takes statements that need to be proved, like for example, a bunch of transactions that need to be proved by a ZK rollup. So the market will take this collection of transactions from the public, and then it will assign jobs to the various GPUs that are available to currently do proofs. But again, we don't wanna assign the entire job of all these transactions to a single GPU. We'd like to break it up into pieces. And so the market might assign, you know, prove the transaction one and two are correct to one prover, and in parallel, prove the transactions three and four are correct to another prover. Well, now we have two proofs for these pairs of transactions. A third prover now would build a proof of proofs that pi one and pi two are correct so that the final proof will be pi and that's the thing that will be pushed to the uh, layer one chain. So again, this is an example where recursion comes up where we can do kind of in parallel, we can have multiple entities prove that various transactions are correct. And then we produce a proof of proofs recursively and that's the thing that's actually pushed onto the chain. Yeah, so again, you can see many, many applications for recursion. So snarks are not just used for proving that statements are correct. They're also used for proving proofs of proofs. And as you can see, that actually comes up again and again and again in different applications. Okay, so we're going to stop here. And in the next segment, we're going to look at a technical problem that comes up when doing recursive proofs and then how to solve it. So we'll see you in a few minutes in the next segment. So welcome back everyone. Now that we understand all the wonderful things that recursive proofs can do for us, I wanna talk a little bit about a technical problem that comes up when doing recursion. In particular, I wanna talk about this question of how to choose curves that are especially well suited for recursive proofs. First of all, let's quickly review what a two level snark recursion is. So as you remember, basically there's an inner proof system SPV, there's a public statement X and the prover P will produce a proof pi that it knows a valid witness W for the statement X. Yeah, so that's what this proof pi proves. And then the outer proof system basically will use the proof pi as a witness and it will produce a proof pi prime that proves that the prover P prime knows a proof that will be accepted by the inner proof system. So rather than P prime proving directly that it knows a witness W, it proves that it knows a proof pi that will be accepted by the verifier of the inner proof system. So now let's quickly review how these proof system works at a high level. So let's fix some circuit C and let's fix a statement X. And to prove that I know a witness W such as C of X W is equal to zero, remember that we use commitments to polynomials. For example, we might commit to univariate polynomials or maybe multivariate polynomials. But let's focus on univariate polynomials for a minute. And the prover commits to a polynomial basically that encodes the computation trace. And then it proves that in fact, the computation trace is a valid computation trace. Now, how do we commit to a univariate polynomial? Well, for that, for example, we could use the KZG proof system. And to do that, we basically needed groups of order P, right? So our, our circuit is defined for our arithmetic operations in the finite field FP. Yeah, so we do additions and multiplications modulo P. And so to commit to polynomials that are defined over FP, we need a group of order P. And using such a group, in fact, a KZG commitment to a polynomial over FP is a single group element in G. But it's important to remember that if we're gonna support circuits with arithmetic in FP, then to commit to polynomials over FP, we need a group G of order P. And the question is, how is a group G represented? So for that, I have to introduce an interesting concept called an algebraic group. Yeah, so what is an algebraic group? Well, we'll say that the group G is an algebraic group defined over the field FQ, if in fact the group G is contained in FQ to the L. That means that every element in the group G is represented as an L tuple over the field FQ. Yeah, so the tuple of L elements represents one element in the group G. And beyond that, the group operation itself can be computed by polynomials over FQ. In particular, there are polynomials, which we'll call F1 to FL. 
such that if I give you two elements in the group G, so A and B are in the group G, of course you remember that A is an L tuple over FQ and B is another L tuple over FQ. Well, the sum of A plus B can be computed by applying the polynomials F1 to FL to the points AB. Yeah, so the group operation itself can be computed by simply applying polynomials over this field FQ. Yeah, so the group itself is embedded in, in L tuples over FQ, and the group operation can be computed using polynomials defined over FQ. In addition, for many algebraic groups, there are many L tuples that represent the same element in the group, and so we also need an algorithm that, given two L tuples in the group, will test whether they actually correspond to the same element in the group. Yeah, this is more of a mechanical thing. The more important thing to understand is that the group has order P, it has P elements in it, but it's defined over FQ, meaning that elements are L tuples over FQ, and addition is implemented using polynomials defined over FQ. And just as an example, I'll tell you that if G is a group of points of an elliptic curve defined over FQ, then this is an example of an algebraic group. Yeah, the group operation can be computed using polynomials. In this case, every element is a three tuple and the group operation can be computed using three polynomials that output the sum of two given points. And this group could have some order P and it turns out that P is gonna be relatively close to Q. Okay, so now what is the problem that we are facing when we're doing recursive proofs? It turns out we have an arithmetic problem. Yeah, so suppose G again is a group of order P defined over FQ. Yeah, so if the group G is of order P, that means that the prover can support doing proofs for circuits that are defined over FP. Yeah, so addition and multiplications in the circuits are defined over FP, but because the verifier needs to verify polynomial evaluation proofs in the group G, it actually needs to do operations in FQ, right? Because group operations in this group are done using additions and multiplications modulo Q. So again, the prover will support circuits defined over FP, but the verifier needs to do operations in FQ in order to verify a proof. So in a picture, we have our prover. The prover says, I can do proofs for circuits over FP. And the verifier says, well, that's great, but I need to do operations in the group G, which requires arithmetic in FQ. And as a result, I need to do arithmetic over FQ in order to verify the proof. So you see there's a mismatch. The prover P prime is doing proofs using the circuit for the verifier V, but there's a mismatch because P prime supports operations in FP, but the verification circuit uses operations in FQ. So the question is what to do, how to resolve this technical problem. And it turns out there's a bunch of solutions. Some of them are good, some of them not so good. The first solution that comes to mind is what's called field emulation. Yeah, let's implement arithmetic in FQ, which is what the verifier needs, as a circuit over FP. Yeah, so now the prover supports circuits over FP. Those circuits implement arithmetic over FQ. So now the prover can produce proof for the verifier circuit because now the verifier circuit is implemented as a circuit over FP. Yeah, so again, every addition and multiplication that the verifier needs to do in FQ will somehow be translated into many additions and multiplications over FP. The problem, of course, is this blows up the size of the verification circuit because every arithmetic operation in FQ now becomes many arithmetic operations in FP. And now the prover is really, really slow. And in fact, this comes up in the real world. For example, to verify a KZG evaluation proof, we need to do what's called a pairing and implementing a pairing using field emulation is huge. So the prover is really quite slow if it has to implement a circuit that verifies KZG proofs, and it does so using field emulation. The verification circuit becomes quite large, and as a result, the prover becomes quite slow. So we'd like to do something better. So here's a better idea. A better idea is let's find an algebraic group G that has order P, and it's also defined over FP. The cool thing about that is now the prover and the verifier will both use arithmetic over FP. Yes, because if the group has order P, that means that the prover can efficiently generate proofs for circuits defined over FP. And because this group is defined over FP, it means that the verifier needs operations over FP to do its verification work. And so there's a very good match here between what the verifier does and what the prover supports. Well, I wish we were this lucky, but unfortunately the universe just doesn't want us to have one of these objects. One can prove that the discrete problem is always very easy in such groups. Yeah, so a group of order P defined over FP is always gonna have an easy discrete log, and as a result, it cannot be used for polynomial commitments. So this just doesn't work. Okay, so are there other solutions we can use? And it turns out the answer is yes. The next thing that comes to mind is what's called a chain of groups. Yeah, so let's try to use a chain of groups where the idea is the following. Let's find groups G1 and G2 
such that G1 has order P, so the prover can deal with circuits defined in over FP, but the group is defined over FQ, so the verifier needs operations in FQ. G2 will have order Q, yeah, so the prover can handle circuits in FQ, you notice there's a match here, and the group is defined over FR. Yeah, so in, in a picture, you know, again, we have a group of order P, it's embedded in FQ, it's defined over FQ, and then we have another group G2, which has size Q, yeah, and it's defined over the field FR. So what's interesting about this picture is that the inner prover can handle circuits over FP. The verifier will need to do operations in FQ, but fortunately the outer prover can now handle operations over FQ quite cheaply. So there's a good match here, and so good things will happen. So let's see, in fact, how we do two levels of recursions using a chain. And it's exactly what we just said. So the inner proof system uses polynomial commitments in G1, which means that the prover P supports circuits defined over FP, so additions and multiplications in the circuits of, are over FP, but because commitments are in G1, the verifier will need to do arithmetic in FQ in order to verify proofs. Okay, the outer proof system is going to use polynomial commitments in G2. The fact that it uses polynomial commitments in G2 means the prover P prime will support circuits over FQ. So the verifier circuit, which needs to do arithmetic in FQ, is now very easily supported by the prover P prime, which supports arithmetic in FQ. So it's quite cheap to implement the verifier circuit V such that the outer prover can do proofs for that verifier. So that's a very cute idea that enables us to do much faster proof recursion than what we would do if we had to do field emulation. And of course, if we had a longer chain of groups, we can support more levels of recursion. Turns out there's an even better idea than simply using chains. It turns out we can actually use cycles of groups. So what are cycles of groups? Well, so here the idea is to find groups G1 and G2, such that G1 has order P and is defined over FQ, and G2 has order Q and is defined over FP. The interesting thing about this structure is that it allows us to do many levels of recursion where we kind of jump back and forth between G1 and G2. Yeah, so maybe it's not completely clear in your mind how we jump back and forth between G1 and G2, so let's do it in a picture. Okay, so our first proof is going to prove that it knows a witness W for the statement X, and so here C is a circuit that's defined over FP, yeah, so it uses arithmetic in FP, which means that the prover P needs a group of size P. Well, that's exactly G1, but G1, of course, is contained in FQ, and therefore the verifier will need operations in FQ. Fine. To verify pi 1, we need to do operations in FQ. Well, fine. The next prover, P prime, is going to use the group G2. Well, as we said, the circuit uses operations in FQ. Fortunately, the group G2 has size Q, so that's well supported, and it's contained inside of FP. So the verifier for P prime is going to do operations modulo P. So we need a group of order P in order to do the next level of recursion. Yeah, but fortunately we can just jump back into G1. G1 has order P and it can therefore support the operations that V prime need to do, which are operations in FP. So the prover P will use G1, which is contained in FQ, and so on and so forth. So when the prover needs to generate a proof for a circuit over FP, it uses G1. And then the next prover will need to generate a proof for circuits over FQ, it'll use G2. The next prover will need to generate a proof for circuit over, over FP, so it will use G1 again and we kind of ping pong back and forth between the two groups. I hope this is clear, it's a very acute idea. I put a link to the original paper that defines this idea, and if you want to read more about this, you can look at this paper. And there have been many other papers since that also kind of explore this idea of using cycles for efficient recursive proofs. Now it turns out there are three types of cycles of length two. Yeah, first of all, if you remember for KZG polynomial commitments, we needed to use what are called pairing groups, right? Groups that support the bilinear pairing. Yeah, and so the first thing that comes to mind is, can we find two groups, G1 and G2, that form a cycle, and they happen to be a pairing group? Yeah, so both G1 and G2 support a pairing. Unfortunately, it turns out that the best constructions for such groups result in relatively large groups, and as a result, this is not very often used. Another thing we can do is we can find a cycle where G1 is a pairing group, so we can use KGG and G1, but G2 is a regular group, so it doesn't support a pairing which would mean that if we want to do a polynomial commitment scheme over G2, we have to use a pairing-free 
polynomial commitment scheme. For example, we discussed bullet proofs in a previous lecture, and there are other polynomial commitment schemes that do not require a pairing. The problem with those is that their evaluation proofs are actually quite large, and so provers that use G2 will end up with quite large proofs, but provers that use G1 will have very short proofs because KZG evaluation proofs are actually very short. So as we do the ping pong between G1 and G2, we just need to make sure that the very last step of the recursion ends with G1 so that the final proof is short. Finally, there's another approach where ne neither of the groups, G1 or G2, is a pairing group. They form a cycle, but neither one is a pairing group, in which case we have to use non-pairing polynomial commitment schemes in both of these groups. So we might end up with slightly larger proofs than otherwise, but, you know, not, not too bad. And it turns out there are some other benefits to using non-pairing groups, both for G1 and G2. And in fact, there's a very famous pair of curves. They're called the pasta curves, Pallas and Vesta. And these, this pasta pair of curves, G1 and G2, is exactly designed for recursive snarks. So how are these pasta curves constructed? Well, it turns out there's a general theory for building such curves. So let's see how that works. It turns out, as we said, there's basically a very large family of, a two, of two cycles of this type 3, where neither one supports a pairing. Yeah, so here I have to assume a little bit of knowledge of elliptic curves. So if you're not comfortable with this, feel free to skip this slide. It's not relevant to anything that we will do later. So let's look at an elliptic curve that's specified by this particular form, right? So it's y squared equals x cubed plus d for some constant d. As it turns out, when we look at curves of this particular form, it turns out that in fact for many primes q, it so happens that if we let p be the number of points in the curve defined over fq, and this number p happens to be a prime, then there's a theorem, it's due to Silverman and Stenget, that shows that the number of points on e defined over fp is equal to q, and the number of points on the curve e over fq is equal to p. So this one elliptic curve actually gives us two groups, one defined over fp and one defined over fq, and lo and behold, they form a cycle. So pasta uses a particular form of this curve, in particular when d is equal to 5, for particular primes p and q, and it turns out that gives us two curves that form a cycle, and both of them are very convenient for recursion, and these pasta curves were actually developed for the HALO2 proving system, and, and it can be quite conveniently used for recursion as long as we're using a polynomial commitment scheme that does not require a pairing. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about this technical issue of arithmetic when doing recursion. What we're going to do in the next segment is we're going to look at a very efficient recursive mechanism using what's called statement folding. And that leads to systems like NOVA and SuperNOVA and other generalizations that are much more efficient than doing simple recursion the way we've been doing it so far. So we'll do that in the next segment, and so I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, so in this last segment, I want to show you some very elegant ideas for very efficient recursion using a technique called statement folding, and this will lead naturally to systems like NOVA, SuperNOVA, and some other generalizations. First of all, why do we need better recursion techniques? Well, if you think about the proof recursion that we saw in the previous parts of the lecture, in those schemes, the prover P had to build a proof for a circuit that actually contains inside of it the entire verification algorithm of a proof system. Now, the verification algorithm of a proof system needs to verify evaluation proofs for a polynomial commitment scheme. It turns out ver these verifying these evaluation proofs inside of an arithmetic circuit can be quite expensive. And so the first idea is implemented in the HALO system, allows us basically to take all of the evaluation proof verifications that, that are related to the polynomial commitment scheme out of the circuit C that the prover has to build the proof for. So in HALO, a big chunk of the verification algorithm is done outside of the circuit C that the prover has to build a proof for. NOVA takes this to the next step. It further simplifies the part of the verification algorithm that the prover has to build a proof for. And as a result, in fact, now when we do recursion, the prover doesn't actually have to build a proof for the entire verification circuit. It only has to build a proof for a very small number of checks, and that's exactly what we're going to see. So this NOVA technique enables us to build proof recursion much faster than we could before. So the way this magic is done is using the concept of a folding scheme. The idea of a folding scheme is to compress two valid instances into one. And let's see what that means. 
So let's, as usual, fix the circuit C, and we're going to build a folding scheme for the circuit C. So what is a folding scheme for C? Well, basically, it's a protocol between two parties. We'll call it the folding prover and the folding verifier. The folding verifier will take two public instances, x1 and x2, for the circuit C, and the folding prover will take those instances along with the corresponding witnesses. So we know that C of x1, w1 is 0, and C of x2, w2 is 0. Now what they'd like to do is they'd like to fold these two instances into a single instance such that if the single instance is correct, that would imply that the original two instances are correct as well. So the way they do it is basically through some sort of an interactive protocol where the folding prover sends a certain value t to the folding verifier. We'll see what t is in just a minute. The folding verifier sends back a random nonce r. And then from that, the folding verifier is able to create a folded statement x. And the folding prover is able, of course, to create the same x and it's as well as fold the witnesses w. Now, the property of a folding scheme is that, in fact, if the original witnesses are correct, then the new witness that the folding prover outputs is correct for the folded instance x that the verifier obtained. So that's one property. So if we start from two valid witnesses, we'll end up with a valid witness. More importantly, we'd like to argue that if, in fact, w is a valid witness for x, then we can extract valid witnesses for x1 and x2. And that's what the knowledge soundness property says. It says that for any potentially malicious folding prover p star, there exists an extractor such that for any instances x1 and x2, if p star is able to output a valid witness for the folded instance x, then the extractor is able to extract from p star valid witnesses w1 and w2 for the original instances x1 and x2. Yeah, so this basically says that, again, if somehow the malicious prover is able to produce a valid folded witness w for the folded statement x, then it must be the case that this malicious prover knew valid witnesses w1 and w2 for the original instances x1 and x2. So this is kind of amazing if we can do this because it says that rather than proving that x1 w1 is valid and x2 w2 is valid, all we need to do is just create a folded instance, and then the prover just needs to prove that this one folded instance is valid, and that already proves that it has witnesses for the original instances that we started with. So that's the idea of a folding scheme, and we're going to see how to construct it in just a second, and then we'll put it to use to do very fast recursion. Now, when you stare at this, you might be wondering, well, wait a minute, this is an interactive process between a prover and a verifier, where we want a non-interactive system at the very end. So we have to make this folding mechanism non-interactive. And as usual, we do that using Fiat Tremir. That unfortunately introduces a complication. So here, instead of the verifier sending the random nonce to the prover, the prover is going to compute the random nonce by itself, just like we do in Fiat Tremir, right? So it's going to hash whatever the verifier has. It has going to hash x1 and x2, along with this value t that was sent to the verifier. By hashing this way, the prover will generate R for itself, and then it can output the folded instance X and the folded witness W. Now, unfortunately, when we do it this way, this introduces an extra complication, because remember, the verifier only sees X and W, and it's supposed to deduce from the fact that W is valid for X, it's supposed to deduce that the prover had W1 and W2 valid for the original X1 and X2. Well, it can only do that if, in fact, R was computed correctly. So actually, what the prover would have to do now is not only output X and W, it would also somehow have to convince the verifier that the value R was actually computed correctly and the folding didn't happen using just some random R that the prover picked arbitrarily. The magical thing is that this is actually much, much simpler than doing regular proof recursion. Okay, so instead of using circuits, we are going to express everything in terms of rank one constraint systems, what's called R1CS. This is something we talked about in a previous lecture. Let me quickly remind you of the R1CS format. So in fact, any circuit can be easily translated into what's called an R1CS program. So an R1CS program, as you may recall, consists of three matrices. I'm going to call them A, B, and D here. And so once we translate the circuit C into matrices A, B, and D, it so happens also that an instance X and a valid witness W prime, for which the circuit values to zero, can be similarly translated into an R1CS witness W, such that if we put X and W together to get Z, so actually for the rest of the lecture, Z is always going to be the concatenation of X and W, it so happens that AZ times BZ is equal to DZ. 
Yeah, now this circle is called the Hadamard product. And just to give an example, I wrote a simple example of, an, of the Hadamard product. You can see this is component-wise multiplication, where xy gets, multiplies y1 and x2 multiplies y2. So basically, we say that w is a valid witness for the R1CS program if z satisfies this vector equality. And again, as I said, it's a simple exercise that I actually encourage you to do to show that any circuit can be converted into an R1CS program such that any satisfying input to the circuit can be converted into a satisfying witness Z for the R1CS program. Yeah, so we say that Z satisfies the R1CS program if this vector equality holds. Okay, so why did we move to R1CS? Well, what we're going to do is we're actually going to build a folding scheme for R1CS. So our goal is to compress two R1CS instances into one. In particular, let's fix the R1CS program ABD. And in fact, we're going to fix it now once and for all. And let's suppose we have two instances. So here we have X1 and X2, and we have witnesses, which we'll call Z1 and Z2 for the R1CS programs, which mean again, that AZI times BZI is equal to DZI for both I equals one and two. That just means that Z1 and Z2 are valid witnesses for the program ABD. Notice, by the way, that for now, we can only fold witnesses Z1 and Z2 that satisfy the same program ABD. Okay, so let's try to fold these two witnesses together, Z1 and Z2. And the most natural thing to do is to try to create some sort of a random linear combination, right? So the verifier is going to choose some random R, and it's going to set the folded instance X to be X1 plus XR2. The prover is going to do the same thing for W1 and W2. So overall, Z is going to be Z1 plus RZ2, which basically evaluates to a random linear combination of the X's and the W's. Okay, so that seems like a very natural thing to do. And let's see if this works. So let's look at AZ times BZ. Yeah, so we have Z, which is the linear combination. And let's just plug it into the program and see what happens. So we look at AZ times BZ, plug in Z in both places. And now we can expand. So we get AZ1 times BZ1 plus R squared. You notice that R appears twice of AZ2 times BZ2. And then we get some cross terms, right? We get an AZ2 times BZ1 and we get an AZ1 times BZ2. Yeah, these are just cross terms that come from this multiplication. Let's call this thing capital E. And now let's see what we get. So we know that AZ1 times BZ1, well, we know what that is. That's equal to DZ1 because we said Z1 is a valid witness for the instance Z1. Similarly, AZ2 times BZ2 is DZ2. So we get R squared DZ2 here plus the cross terms. Okay, so now when we look at this equality, it turns out this is a little bit problematic for us because this is not exactly an R1CS instance. What we want is that AZ times BZ is equal to DZ, but it's not. It's equal to some crazy linear combination with some noise of the original instances. Yeah, so we can't just say that folding two R1CS instances gives us another R1CS instance because that didn't quite work. But it almost works. Yeah, if we allow for this error term and we allow for some other scalars here, then in fact, maybe we can get something to work. And so this is going to motivate what's called a relaxed R1CS instance. So what's a relaxed R1CS instance? Again, we're going to fix the R1CS program ABD, except now the instance itself is going to include some noise parameters. So there's going to be a scalar C and a vector E. Yeah, so X, C, and E together are basically an R1CS instance. And we'll say that the witness Z satisfies this instance if, again, when we put X and W together, it so happens that AZ times BZ is not equal to DZ like before, but it's equal to C times DZ plus E. Yeah, so we allow a bit of slack in that DZ can be multiplied by the scalar C, and we can add some noise E to the result. Well, now let's try to fold to our relaxed R1CS instances and see how this works. So again, we fix the program ABD and we have two relaxed R1CS instances. Yeah, so again, X1, C1, E1 and X2, C, E2, E2. Those are the public parts of the relaxed R1CS program. And then we have two, in two witnesses, Z1 and Z2. And these are valid witnesses. So we know that basically the relaxed formula is satisfied for I equals one and two. And again, I stress that all we did to R1CS is we just allowed it to be multiplied by a scalar and we add some potential error vector EI. Well, now let's see if we can actually fold two relaxed R1CS instances into one. And now things are going to work actually quite well. Yeah, so what the prover will do is first is going to compute all the cross terms. Yeah, so it turns out it's going to compute this term T, which is going to include all the cross terms and it's going to send this T to the verifier. 
the verifier is going to choose a random R, yeah, just like we did before, and we're going to create random, a random linear combination based on this R. So R will be sent to the prover, and then the verifier will fold the two instances together using this R. So it'll take a linear combination of the X's, it'll take a linear combination of the C's, and with the error term, it will actually do something a little bit more sophisticated. It will compute E1 plus R2 plus R squared E2. Okay, that's all that the verifier will do to fold the two instances. So it's just very simple arithmetic on vectors, and that's all the verifier has to do. What will the prover do? The prover just does what it does before. Yeah, so it just takes the two witnesses, Z1 and Z2, and combines them using R, and this gives us the new witness Z. Okay, so, so the question now, is this new witness Z a valid relaxed R1CS witness for this new relaxed R1CS instance that we got by folding the two instances that we had? Well, let's check. So AZ times BZ, again, we can plug in the value for Z, which is Z1 plus RZ2, and we can expand just as before. So we get AZ1, BZ1 plus R squared, AZ2, BZ2, plus the cross terms, just like we had before. But now what do we know about AZ1, BZ1? Well, AZ1, BZ1 satisfies the relaxed R1CS condition, so it's equal to the right-hand side of the R1CS equality. Similarly for AZ2, BZ2. Okay, and you notice that the two cross terms are multiplied by R. I'm just going to take the R out, and I'm left with the sum of these two cross terms here. Okay, so now let's rearrange things just a little bit. And so you notice what I did is I brought the E1 and E2 together. So we have E1 plus R squared E2. And it turns out I can kind of also combine DZ1 and DZ2. Yeah, so I write them as DZ1 plus R DZ2 times C1 plus R C2. Yeah, and if you expand this out, you'll basically get the terms that we have over here, C1 DZ1 and R squared C2 DZ2, plus some other error terms. And actually what's interesting is if you look at these other error terms, they exactly were already canceled out by what we put into T. So T actually, if you go back to the pay, to the slide that defines t, t is basically these two cross terms that we always have to deal with, minus some error terms that come from this multiplication. And so this equality holds because of how we define t. But now the amazing thing is that we know that c1 plus rc2 is equal to c, and this is actually how we defined e, so we get cdz plus e. And lo and behold, this is another relaxed r1cs instance. So what this says is that W, from which we derived Z, remember Z is simply X concatenated with W, so W, the folded witness, is in fact a valid relaxed R1CS instance for the instance X and this new C and this new E. So the simple calculation that we did here simply shows that in fact the, the Z that we constructed, Z is equal to Z1 plus RZ2, in fact is a valid witness for the new folded instance XCE, which is what the folding verifier actually built, right? So in fact, the folded witness satisfies the folded instance that the verifier got. Why is this secure? In particular, why is this knowledge sound? Well, in their paper, the authors actually show that this is knowledge sound. They show that for every folding prover P star, there's an extractor E, such that if you look at any pair of relaxed R1CS instances, if the folding verifier outputs XCE as the folded instance and P star is able to output a valid witness for this folded instance, then in fact the extractor can extract W1 and W2 for the given instances, for the input instances, and these are going to be valid witnesses for these instances. Now I oversimplified just by a little bit. In fact, the relaxed R1CS instances have to contain one more term. It's actually a quadruple, not a triple and it has to contain also a commitment to W. That's done for, for a technical reason, so that this extraction can go through. But for our purposes, we'll just assume that the relaxed R1CS instances are triples. But just keep in mind that there actually is a fourth element that's needed for the extraction theorem to, to hold. Now, this actually by itself is still not good enough. So in a relaxed instance, the verifier has to store X, which is the original instance. It has to store C, which is just a scalar, but it also has to store E. And the problem is that this E can be quite large. In particular, it could be much, much larger than X. This E actually is somewhat related to the size of the computation, the total computation. Well, the poor verifier can only run in time that's proportional to the size of X. It's not allowed to run in time that's proportional to the size of the computation. And as a result, we can't send this E to the verifier. This E is too big for the verifier to accept. So we have to get rid of E somehow. 
And the way we do that is by replacing E by a commitment to E. Yeah, so this is called a committed relaxed R1CS, where now what we'll do is the instance will contain X and C as before, and in addition, it will just contain a short commitment to this noise E, and the prover will have E in the clear as part of the witness. Yeah, and of course, whenever we verify committed relaxed R1C and witness, we have to verify that E and RE are a proper opening of the commitment in the relaxed R1CS instance. Yeah, so the only thing we did is we just replaced E by a commitment to E and shoved E in the witness, and now the instance itself is not much bigger than, than the original instance X. Now, remember the verifier has to do all sorts of arithmetic operations on E, so for the folding to actually work, the commitment scheme that we use has to be an additive commitment scheme. So let me remind you what an additive commitment scheme is. So let's quickly review what a commitment scheme is. So a commitment scheme has a commit algorithm and a verify algorithm. The commit algorithm will take a message, some randomness, and output a commitment. The verify algorithm will take the message, the commitment, and this randomness that would use to create the commitment. This is sometimes called the opening of the commitment and decide to accept or reject. Yeah, and as usual, a commitment scheme has to be binding and hiding. Binding just means that the adversary can never produce a commitment with two valid openings for this commitment. Once it outputs a commitment, it can only open it in one way. And hiding just means that the commitment reveals nothing about the committed data. Hiding is primarily needed when we talk about zero knowledge proofs. If we don't care about the zero knowledge property, we don't have to use a hiding commitment. Binding is the main property that we would need. Now, what makes a commitment scheme additively homomorphic? Well, so we need this extra property where the messages themselves are going to be vectors over a field, the randomness is going to be an element of the field, and I'm going to assume that the commitments themselves lie in some additive group, okay? And we'll say that the commitment scheme is homomorphic if for all messages M1, M2, and randomness is R1, R2, it so happens that if I commit to M1 using R1, this produces a, a group element, and I commit to M2 using R2, this is commits another group element. If I sum those two up, I get a commitment to M1 plus M2 with respect to R1 plus R2. Yeah, this is the additive property that says that I can add up two commitments and obtain the commitment of the sum of the committed values. Yeah, and we'll say that the commitment scheme is succinct if the commitment itself is very short. In fact, we're going to assume it's the commitment itself could be like 256 bits, so it's kind of constant size, and then we'll say that it's succinct. And in fact, there are many additively homomorphic commitment schemes. I'll just say the names here. One is called the Pedersen commitment scheme. There are lattice-based homomorphic commitment schemes. I'm not going to explain how these commitment schemes work here. If you want to see how they work, you can look up Pedersen commitments, and you'll see exactly how we build an additively homomorphic commitment scheme. Now, once we have an additively homomorphic commitment scheme, we can build a folding scheme for committed relaxed R1CS instances. Yeah, so again, we fixed the, the R1CS program ABD, and the instance is going to be X, C, and a commitment to E. The witness that the prover has is going to be some vector Z, the vector E, which is an opening of this commitment E, using the randomness RE. Yeah, and the only thing we know is that if this is a valid witness, then we know that AZ times BD, BZ is equal to CDZ plus E, and E and RE are in fact an opening of the commitment E. So that's what an instance is, and that's what, what it means for a witness to be a valid witness for this committed, relaxed R1CS instance. As usual, now we're going to take two such instances. Yeah, we're going to fix the program ABD, and we're going to take two such instances and see if we can fold them into a single instance. Well, so here's again the folding strategy, which is exactly what we saw before. So the prover is going to compute this vector t. And again, the problem is that this vector t is too big to send to the verifier because this vector t is basically as big as the computation. So instead, what we'll do is the prover will commit to the vector t and send the commitment to the verifier. Again, this is done using the additively homomorphic commitment scheme. The verifier does what it normally does. It chooses a random r, sends r to the prover, and then it just folds the two instances. So it will fold x1 and x2, it will fold c1 and c2, and now when it does the folding, it doesn't apply it to e, because it doesn't have e, it only has a commitment to e, but that's okay, it can fold the commitment to e because of the additively homomorphic property. In particular, it's going to compute exactly what it did before on the plaintext e, it's going to do exactly the same thing on the commitments, right? It adds the commitment to e uh, to e1, plus r times the commitment to t, plus r squared times the commitment to e2. And again, the reason it can do that is because the commitment scheme is homomorphic. What does the prover do? The prover just does the same thing as before. The prover does a linear combination of its witnesses. It computes 
the updated E, you notice this matches the commitment. So E is still going to be an opening of the commitment to E. And the same thing it does for the randomness that's used to open that commitment. Okay, so E comma RE is an opening of the commitment com sub E. Okay, so this is how we fold two relaxed R1CS instances. And I want you to look at this for just a minute. It's really quite remarkable that the work is, is really quite low. All that happens in order to fold is we just basically take a linear combination of the two instances that we were given. So we combine X1 and X2. Similarly, we combine Z1 and Z2. And basically, that's it. That's kind of how the folding works. So it's, it's extremely fast. And of course, we have to ask, why is this secure? And again, in the paper, there's a proof that this is complete and knowledge sound. Okay, so now we see how to fold two relaxed R1CS instances into one. Now that we have a folding scheme, let's go ahead and put it to use. What I'd like to do is show you how to build a very efficient mechanism for incrementally verifiable computation, for IVC. And so let me remind you that IVC means that we're trying to prove that a computation that iterates the same function over and over and over again is done correctly. In particular, the prover knows these omega 1 to omega n such that Sn is in fact the result of applying omega 1 to omega n to an initial state S0. And we said in the earlier part of the lecture that in fact IVC can capture arbitrary computation because F could implement like a microprocessor and then all we're doing is we're just running steps of a microprocessor over and over and over again and that basically captures any computation we want. So now we're going to do IVC using folding instead of snark recursion. In the first part of the lecture, we saw how to do IVC using recursion, where at every step we would have to produce a proof that everything up until this point was correct. The next step would verify that the proof is correct. So the prover at step i would have to construct a proof that the verification circuit ran correctly on the proof of step i minus 1. So again, the prover has to work quite hard in order to generate a proof that the entire verification circuit ran correctly. Using folding, we're going to build an IVC that's much, much more efficient. In particular, there's no need to run the verifier circuit inside of the SNARK prover. So this is really quite remarkable that we can completely move away from running the verifier's circuit inside of the SNARK prover. Okay, so let's see how this is done. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an R1CS program ABD. What this program will do is the following. It's going to take the following input. So the input is going to include the step number, step number i. It's going to take the initial state s0. Then it's going to take two consecutive states, s and s prime. And it's going to take the input omega at, at step i. And of course, it's also going to take a witness. Now the program will check that if s is the state at step i, then s prime really is the state at step i plus 1. And if i is equal to 0, if we're at the beginning of the process, then in fact the state s is equal to the initial state s0. Okay, so that's all this program does. It's a very simple R1CS program. It's not much more complicated than simply evaluating the function f. Now, we can kind of represent this, of course, as a committed R1CS instance. Yeah, so the instance is going to contain x. It's going to contain c in a commitment to e. But, of course, these are very simple relaxed R1CS instances, simply where c is equal to 1 and e is equal to 0. Yeah, the witness, of course, is going to contain w and the opening of the commitment to e. And what do we know? We know that if we put x and w together to obtain z, then this is a valid R1CS instance, and e and re are, in fact, an opening of com e. I want you to remember that when we first build a witness for this program, the relaxation is not needed. So c is equal to 1 and e is equal to 0. Now, how do we use this for IVC? Well, if you think about this, IVC really is a sequence of valid instance witness pairs. Here I had to use somewhat of a small font to get everything to fit. So here you can see that the first pair of inputs is S0, S1. The second pair of inputs is S1, S2, then S2, S3, then S3, S4. And what this, the fact that these are all valid witnesses means that S1 is F of S0, S2 is F of S1, S3 is F of S2, S4 is f of S3, and so on and so forth. So the final output of the computation is S4. And if these are all valid, then in fact S4 is the correct output of the computation. So if S4 is the correct output of the computation, then in fact the prover has valid witnesses for all four of these instances of the program ABD. The verifier can, of course, by itself verify all four of these instances one after the other, but that verification work will be linear in the size of the computation. 
Instead, I imagine you can kind of guess what we're going to do. We're going to fold together the first two of these instances, and we're going to obtain this instance x12, which is a folding of the first and second instances. Now, you remember, x12 is a random linear combination of x1 and x2. So x12 at this point is gibberish. It no, no longer has this kind of nice structure. And now we're going to keep going. We're going to fold the second and the third instance, and we're going to end up with x13, which is a folding of the first three instances that we were given. And we're going to keep going. We're going to fold x13 with the fourth instance, and we're going to get this instance x14, which is actually a folding of all four instances that we were given. Now, the point here is, again, if the prover has a satisfying witness for this one folded instance, that means that it has a satisfying witness for all the folded instances. Because as an extractor, they can go ahead and extract witnesses for all the underlying instances that were folded into x14. And so the amazing thing here is that we end up with one instance, which represents the entire computation. The prover needs to prove that, in fact, it has a, it has a valid witness for this folded instance. If it can do that, then again, by extraction, it has valid witnesses for all the instances that were folded into x14. And so we do this, this super fast folding, and we end up with one relaxed R1CS instance, and then the prover can use whatever proof system it wants to prove that it has a valid witness for this single folded instance at the very end. Yeah, so that's the magic of folding. Unfortunately, things are not so simple. Yeah, I kind of cheated you a little bit in that it's not enough for the prover to simply do the folding. Remember, I told you that the folding process is an interactive process. To make it non-interactive, we have to use Fiat-Chamir, but now, when we make it non-interactive, the prover has to prove that the Fiat-Chamir challenge that it computed is, in fact, a result of the hash function. So it is actually computed correctly. The verifier, of course, doesn't have any of the underlying instances, so it can't check that R13 was done correctly. All the verifier sees is just the very, very last result of folding. It can't verify that the folding was done correctly. So somehow the prover has to prove that when it did the folding, it actually used the correct R13. Otherwise the extractor will not work and we lose the soundness property. Another thing that the prover also has to prove is that all these instances that were folded together are all linked together. So the output of step number i really is the input into step number i plus one. So we need to link all the instances together. And the way we do that is actually by augmenting the R1CS program ABD. So we're gonna augment it into a more complicated R1CS program called A prime, B prime, D prime. I'm not gonna give all the details here, but just to give you the idea, what will happen is that this augmented program is gonna take basically the three instances, XI, X1 to I, and X1 to I plus one, this program itself is going to check that, in fact, x1 to i plus 1 is a correct folding of x1 to i and xi, and that xi is a valid instance. So we're going to create a more complicated R1CS program, and that more complicated R1CS program will verify that the witnesses are correct for the instances being folded, and it will also verify that the folding is done correctly. Now, how to actually do it, honestly, there, there are a lot of details that I didn't want to get into. They're described in the paper if you're interested. But the important fact is that this augmented circuit, all it does is it just checks that F was computed correctly. And in addition, it just needs to do two multiplications in the group G. This is checking that the folding was done correctly. That only requires two multiplications. And literally, you can see what these multiplications are. Here, we have to multiply R13 by X3. That's one multiplication. And we have to multiply the commitment to T13 by R13. Yeah, those are the two multiplications that this augmented circuit needs to do. So the remarkable thing is that when we do IVC using Nova, the prover is basically manipulating now a program that just does the basic evaluation of F, just like before, plus two multiplications in the group. That's it. If you compare that to normal recursion, there the prover had to evaluate the function F, but it also had to run the entire verification circuit of a SNARK. So here in Nova, we replace running the verification circuit of a SNARK simply by two multiplications in G and some simple hashing. The hashing is the cheap part. These, this part is kind of the expensive overhead over computing the function f. So again, these two multiplications are much faster than verifying that a SNARK proof is correct. And as a result, we end up with a much faster way to implement IVC. 
Now, the last thing I'll say is that Nova allows us to do an IVC where, where the same function is evaluated over and over and over and over again. It turns out in reality, sure, this is already sufficient because the function f can simply be a microprocessor that runs over and over, but in reality, it would be much nicer if we can implement different functions at every step. That's what Supernova lets us do. This is an extension of Nova, where in fact, in the chain, we can have multiple types of functions. Yeah, f1 to fk, we can have k different types of functions. Each one can appear multiple times. Another interesting generalization that just re recently came out is called Sangria. Again, I put a link to Sangria if you're interested in reading more about this. What Sangria observes is that a Nova folding scheme can be applied to any quadratic constraint system. Nova happened to apply it to relaxed R1CS, but in fact, it can apply to any quadratic constraint system. In particular, we can look at Planck arithmetization, and if we only stick to addition and multiplication gates, then if you remember, the Planck verification circuit is really just a quadratic constraint system. As a result, we can literally do folding on Planck arithmetization, and what that allows us to do is run IVC where f now is not represented as an R1CS, but rather it's represented using Planck arithmetization. This is again a more powerful arithmetization technique, and so as a result, the function f is going to be smaller, so it's going to be easier to do the folding because the witnesses are going to be smaller, and things will be more efficient, again, because f is represented using a more powerful arithmetization technique. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the lecture. As you can see, there's a lot of different ideas that are used in recursion. Recursion is sort of an up and coming technique that's gonna be used more and more, especially when we have to do proofs for very large and complicated statements. Recursion is almost the only way we can prove very complicated statements because of memory constraints and timing constraints as well. And so recursion is definitely becoming a fairly important concept, especially when it comes to doing complicated proofs in ZK rollups. And so again, we're gonna be seeing more and more ideas for making recursion efficient. Here I just showed you some of the beautiful ideas that have come up in the last year or two. If you're interested in learning more about this, I highly recommend reading the papers that we pointed to throughout the presentation. And so I hope you dive deeper into some of this work. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope it was clear. And this actually brings us to the end of the part of the course where we destri describe efficient snark constructions. In the next couple of lectures, we're going to turn to various applications. And so we'll put to use everything that we've discussed so far. Yeah, so I hope you enjoy the rest of the course. Thank you all, and we'll see you in the next lecture.